uh, Francois Labori, and the title of the talk is uh, Introduction to Higgs Bundles. Francois. Okay, so uh, Sfakete, welcome back to the galleys. So um, I'm going to uh, start a new course. So it's not going to be a continuation of what I did uh, uh, last week, although there are going to be a connection at some point, and actually also many connections. Ha -ha. Anyway, um, so I'm going to talk about today, about 19th century mathematics, and uh, it should be part of the culture of uh, every geometer. So um, it's really something that we should learn and, uh, and think about some basic algebraic geometry for curves. So in my talk, uh, okay, so I want to, I'm going to be interested in the following object in the end, which is something which I'm going to denote K of SG. So G is a Lie group. And at that level of generality, I don't care, but I'm going to, to care only about semi-simple Lie groups. And this is what? So this is a space of homomorphism of pi 1 of s into g divided by g. So where's the action of g? So if, if rho is a map from pi 1 of s into g, so of course s is, a, as usual, a closed compact surface. This is, I'm sorry, closed surface connected, and the genus is greater than uh, 2. Right? So rho is a homomorphism from pi 1 of s to, uh, to g, and the action of g on that, so since I have chosen the right action, is going to be g minus 1 rho times g. So this is equal to g, I'm sorry, it's going to be rho times g, which is his right action here. Okay? Meaning that rho times g, so rho g of some element gamma, this is going to be rho g, rho of gamma, g minus, uh, g, g minus 1. Okay? So there's an action of this group g on this space, and the space of representation is this quotient. So again, I should put some little quote here, because this quotient is not always well defined, but we're not going to get uh, in the subtlety here, but it's going to be well defined for the case I'm going to consider today, which is an S when G is a billion or when G is compact. Okay? So I want to interpret, the goal of today is to interpret this object the goal of this work in uh, a complex geometric data. Okay. So I'm going to talk about, so in my a talk, uh, S would be a Riemann surface. which you can think of it as a uh, one, uh, as a dimension, as a complex curve. So this means that this object, so as a complex object, its dimension would be one. And here you consider that this, uh, the real dimension is two. Okay. So what's a Riemann surface? So you had a lecture by that with an Orbert. So I'm going to think of it in two different ways. So here it's a couple S, J, where S is a two-dimensional real manifold. On J is uh, for every x, and j is the map which associates to, uh, to a point x in S, a element jx, which is a endomorphism 
of the tangent bundle of x at s with j square is equal to one, uh, minus one, sorry. So that's one point of view. And of course, you have to impose some regularity of the map x give to jx, or and there is some equivalence, which is because the dimension of real dimension of s is equal to two, otherwise this is not true. Same thing as an atlas, given by an atlas on, on s, with charts in C, and a change of coordinates uh, are holomorphic. I think you covered this point of view, this, two, this, uh, this fact with Norbert, and um, I'm going to take that for granted. So it follows that then you can define, then you have, you can define, so now this is a set of objects that you can define. You can define so let's say holomorphic functions so let's say defined on some open set U in S. So again, you have two points of view. So either, so in equivalent way, so either you have DF, so you have F, which is a function with uh, defined from U to C. So either you say that DF of J of U is equal to I DF of U, or locally in some charts, so in charts, in the charts with coordinate z, then f is equal to f of z, where f is a usual holomorphic function. Okay? So now you a, may want to do that for forms. So the basic object of differential geometry. So we so let omega p of s in the space of uh, complex valued forms. P forms on S, uh, uh, right, so it means that instead of taking as in, uh, in a real geometry, uh, the real value form, you take the complex value form, so then you have a splitting, and you have a splitting of, uh, so I'm going just to take P is equal to 1, or P is equal to 2, right? So what happened for a? So what happened for uh, the one form? So this is just form, so that. Uh, so it, it's just uh, so at, at the point, so space of some omega, okay. So so if omega belongs to that, so then. So it means that omega, of uh, it's just a omega at the point x is a form with value in C. So you can split it into, then uh, you can take right omega of x is equal to uh, omega 1, 0 of x plus omega 0, 1 of x. So what is this object? So this is a complex linear, linear. So this form is just R linear. So you can split it as a complex linear plus something which is um, complex antilinear.
So this decomposition give rise, so this give rise to a decomposition um, omega one is equal to omega one zero plus omega one zero. Zero, uh, one zero plus zero one. So, what does this notation mean? So, omega one zero is a space of complex linear forms. And omega zero one is a spec space of complex antilinear forms. So what does it mean locally? So in charts. So omega, which belongs to omega one zero, this is equivalent to the fact that you can write omega is equal to locally. f of the dz, okay, because this is a standard complex linear form, and omega, which belongs to omega one zero, is equivalent to the fact that you can write omega is equal to f of the dz bar, okay. So. So this is definition for one form, but of course this definition extends to p forms, and I'm just going to do that for the two forms. So omega two of s can be written as omega two zero of s plus omega uh, one one of s plus omega zero two of s. So you could see what does it mean in terms of uh, being complex on some object, on, on, uh, on linear on some object, on linear on some other uh, place you fit in your tensor. But let's do that locally. So locally, so if we take omega, so that object would be something of the form f of z dz wedge dz. So that would be something which is of the form f of z dz wedge dz bar. And that would be of the form f of z dz bar wedge dz bar. But now if you are in dimension one, dz wedge dz is zero, okay? Because if you take a one form, its wedge with itself is zero, so it follows that for a surface, this guy is zero, and this guy is zero, so the only two forms that you have are the forms of type 1-1. One, one. No, 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 f is not holomorphic at this stage, it's any functions, yeah, you're right, so, uh, so watch out, so far, f is just a function which is a smooth function, okay? So that's just going to be the form of tab one zero or the form of tab zero one. Okay, so now indeed I have to talk of what it is, what happens when f is holomorphic? So example, if I take now a function f, which is a, a smooth function, I can be interested in, in, uh, in, uh, inter in, interesting in consider df. 
and it has a decomposition. So it is df of type 1, 0 plus df of type 0, 1. Okay. So how do you say that f is holomorphic? I said f, f is holomorphic if only if df is c linear. So f is holomorphic. This is equivalent to the fact that df of type 0, 1 is equal to 0. Right? There is no antilinear part in df. Right. Now I want to define what is a holomorphic form. So let's first define this in coordinates. So definition, and I'm only going to care about one forms, but you can imagine that this can be extended uh, for in higher dimension on, on, on other. So say omega, uh, one form S is holomorphic. If you can write in coordinates omega is equal to f of z dz, where uh, f is holomorphic. So that's my definition of being a holomorphic form. In any charts, you can write this this way. So now let's try to, to write an invariant, define, do an invariant way to define that. So let's try to do it invariantly. Let's try to do it, let's do it invariantly. Imagine I have omega, which is equal to f dz. It's a form, which is just a form of type 1, 0. Okay? And f is just a function, which is a smooth function. Complex-valued smooth function. So, uh, let's now take the differential of omega. Okay? So, this is going to be df which is easy, okay? Uh, and then I make my decomposition. So this is going to be df of type 1, 0, wedge uh, dz, plus df of type 1, 0, wedge dz bar. Um, I'm sorry, which DZ again? I'm just using my decomposition, but DF one zero wedge DZ is of the form, sorry, something like alpha DZ wedge DZ, so it's equal to, it's equal to zero. So uh, it follows that uh, uh, so now omega holomorphic, you can see that the proposition I want to get, which is the following. So proposition omega is holomorphic, the same thing as omega here is of type 1, 0, and d of omega is equal to 0. The holomorphic form is just a form which is of type 1, 0, and which is closed. So I want to have to do a little more work here, but it exactly says that. Right? And, okay, so we have df 0, 1 is equal to alpha dz bar, and df 0, 1 wedge dz bar 
this is equal to alpha wedge dz, dz uh, alpha times dz wedge dz bar. And this is non-zero. It's a form which is non-zero. So this is zero, it's just the same thing as alpha being zero. Okay, so we have this characterization of what is a holomorphic form just in terms of the operator D on this decomposition. Okay, so let me check if I said all I wanted to say on this, on forms. Good exercise, check the, the, minus, the minus plus on the, check everything. Yeah, yeah, if you, sorry, that's, there is no bar here. There is a minus here. Okay, let's let's uh, make it okay. Right. Okay, so now I want to give a. Uh, so I so my goal is uh, to explain some classical result of a nineteenth century geometry, but of course I want to uh, to paint them in some modern language. And I want to use this 19th century uh, uh, stuff as a way to introduce uh, Higgs bundles. So the first thing I want to talk about is chi of SR. So what is chi of SR? This is just a space of homomorphism because the action by conjugation uh, R is an abelian group. In this case, just the homomorphism of pi 1 of S into R, so this is just the H1 of S. So I just put quotes here because there's various definition of what could be a H1. So let for me, let's just consider this, this, this set. So let's uh, introduce uh, the theorem, uh, which is a... Um, Uh, so I'm just going to, it, to, to do it in a, in a weak way. So the Riemann, so I'm going to add Hodge because Hodge has a, uh, this uh, far-reaching generalization of that theorem, which is the following. So H, oh, oh, um, I'm sorry, I, I did forget something. So, which is a notation, a notation so notation uh, let H uh, one zero of S be the space of holomorphic one forms. On S. Uh, this is a standard notation, right? No, bear. This is this is a standard notation, right? The space of holomorphic is H one zero, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, because there's another notation, but which is so. Okay. What's the theorem of Riemann Hodge? So I'm going to give something way more precise in a few uh, minutes. So you have an identification between H10 of S. This is isomorphic to I of SR. So here we have the prototype of what I want to uh, talk about, which is a, an identification between this object and the holomorphic object. Okay, so let's explain how this identification is done. What?
as vector spaces so far? Real vector, vector spaces. Well, chi of SR has no complex structure. So it's, a, it's isomorphic as, as a vector spaces. But again, I'm going to give a better, a better a, uh, statement. So let alpha be a holomorphic one form. And we saw that in particular, alpha is closed. So let gamma be a closed curved on S. And we can define a real period of alpha. It's a P gamma of alpha. So this is going to be the integral over gamma of alpha. Uh, and I take the real part. I take this, this is a complex number, a priori, and I take the real part of that. So the classical fact that you have checked many times that, uh, in particular, since alpha is closed, since alpha is closed, the map uh, gamma gives rise to P gamma of alpha is a uh, homomorphism, it's a, a, it's a group of morphism from a by one of S to R. Okay, so of course, the isomorph, the claim which I'm going to, to make now is Aim. P gamma has two parts. So P gamma, uh, the map, okay, so the map from H1, H01 of S to chi of SR, which is given by alpha, give rise to P gamma, uh, the map which is uh, gamma to P gamma of alpha is a ve uh, vector, vector, how do you say, vector space isomorphism? Okay, that's what I want to explain. So there, is a, there are many proofs of that. Some of them are way more beautiful and way more simpler than what I'm going to explain. So I'm going to explain a complicated proof, basically ugly, but I hope it's going to help you understand what's going to happen in higher dimensions. I'm going to give, essentially because I'm going to give a framework of that, which is general, and I'm going to explain a proof that can be generalized uh, in the next, uh, in the next uh, the tomorrow, tomorrow, or tomorrow. So, I'm going to draw a picture which I'm going to draw many, many times. Uh, right. So, here I have a chi of SR. And here I have a H10 of S, the holomorphic one form. And instead of making a direct connection between the two objects, I'm going to introduce a third object, which is going to be here. So uh, the object I'm going to describe here is a... Uh, is a, it's a space of a couples, so it's going to be a space of F rho, where rho is a, an element of chi of SR, and F is a harmonic 
equivariant map, row equivariant map, from A, the universal cover of S, to uh, R. Okay? So I need to explain many things here. So I need to explain, do we have a red... Um, The talk. So I need to explain many things. So I'm going to explain what is a harmonic, what does it mean to be harmonic, what does it mean to be equivalent. Then I need to explain that they have mapped this way and this way. And uh, so this map are actually going to be easy maps. This one is easy. And then I want to a, a build map which are go the map which goes this way. So it turned out that this one is also going to be easy or not too difficult. And this one is going to be uh, the actual theorem. And I'll first want to claim that all these objects are isomorphic, right? So this is going to be my point of view. I have this holomorphic object. I have this topological object. And I want to introduce a third object, which is more complicated, which actually involves the terms, away the term harmonic and equivalent. OK? So I need to explain a, uh, some stuff. Right, so a, let's do, okay, something which is easy, which is very easy at this stage, which is this map from here to here. So it's one of uh, Mahan's beloved a concept. It's a forgetful functor. So you have a couple F row. I know, I know from, from, uh, that he loves functors. So you have a map, you have a couple, space of couples F row, and just forget the first guy. So I just obtain row. So this map is just Mahan's forgetful functor. F row give rise to row. So that's a very easy map. So let's explain what, it's, what it means to be harmonic. So I'm going to give a definition. So definition, a map F from X. So this is a, a Riemann surface. So I'm changing my notation here because I'm going to apply the definition to the universal cover of S, which is again a Riemann surface, right? Is harmonic, so it's, a, it's from R. So is harmonic. if the differential of the differential of j is zero, right? So that's my definition of being a harmonic. So that uh, gives a definition, and now I need to, to give the definition of an uh, equivalent map. So it turned out uh, low dimensions are very confusing in general because you're sort of mixed up of what is R. So R is many things. How does R act on R here? So, um, 
So, so here you consider, so what does equivalent mean? So, uh, so I'm myself confused. So, so I want to make R, R acts on R by translation. Okay. So what does it mean that F is equivalent? It just means that F of uh, X, F of uh, gamma of X, is equal to f of x plus rho of gamma, right? So that's my definition of being equivalent. So I just map, I just uh, add the map by a translation. So, uh, so now let's say I want to explain the is this easy map. So this map is the map one. So I've defined all these objects here. I want to define this map two. Uh, okay, so I think I can write here. So let's define the map two. Um, so let's define map two. Uh, right. So since X, which is a universal cover of S, is simply connected, so assume that F is harmonic, F is harmonic, so we have that D F composed with J is um, is what is uh, is closed. And it follows that the F composed with J is equal to DH. Right? So now I can uh, define a new uh, function, so let psi, which is equal to f, and uh, this time I try to, uh, to get the, the sign correct, minus ih. Okay, so I define this function, which is, wait, I'm sorry. So df, so what is df? So df is a one form, so at the point x, this is an homomorphism from Txs or s to c, to r actually in this context, right? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, bad parenthesis. Sorry. That's clear now? Right, so, but you, 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 so anyway, this, you can compose the one form with the endomorphism of that, right? So. I'm so sorry. So DF composed with J is closed. So it's a, it's a differential or something. And now I can define a new function, which is f plus i dot, then little exercise. Psi is holomorphic. At f harmonic is the same thing as to say that psi 
is holomorphic. And if you do that by yourself, you could use 1, 0, 0, 1 decomposition, or do it by hand, or choose coordinates, or whatever. But it's something that you have to remember that a, F, a, fun, a real function is a harmonic if and only if it is a real part of a complex, if a holomorphic, holomorphic function, which is, let's say. So what is the property about psi now? Psi is uh, equivariant and uh, some representation Row zero. Now from R, from pi one of S into C, whose real part is rho. So, so the real part of the the fact that rho zero, the real part of rho zero is a, is rho is just because F is equivalent under rho, so this means that the real, the fact, the real number has moved uh, along rho. But on the other hand, when you perform this integration, h is going to be equivalent under something exercise. But this exercise is not. This is not truly related to rho. And one has to do some uh, clever stuff to understand what is the imaginary part. I don't care about that again. Only thing I know is, is that. So this is the worst proof ever. Why is it the worst proof ever? Because I'm somehow using uh, a Poincaré lemma, which is way after Riemann, and uh, I'm using a lot of technology here to prove that. But I want to, again, to put this into this frame. So, a, so what does that mean? So in particular, In particular, deep psi is uh, well defined is is a pi one of s invariant. Okay, because the uh, deep psi of uh, deep size is equal to composed with uh, uh, gamma, gamma star deep psi. This is D of gamma star of psi. So this is D psi plus D time rho zero of gamma, and which is a constant. So this is zero. So this function is really invariant to the gamma, and uh, Deep psi is holomorphic. So this implies that this belongs to H10 of S. So that's concludes, that's, that's concludes. This concludes. So our map is two from F. We associate, so that's a map two, which associate this deep psi on. S. Right. So I claim this is a, actually not difficult because it does not involve any theorem other than Poincaré lemma. Right? So this is the, another easy map. So now I want to claim that this map also is easy. Okay? And why is it easy? So what is this map? Oh, and this map three, the construction of three. Of the map three. So, so you start with omega, which is in, in one zero. So, so what do you do that you lift omega, so the lift of omega on uh, x, which is equal to the universal cover of S, is now exact. 
Remember that uh, holomorphic form holomorphic form are, are closed, so you can write d omega is equal to um, omega is equal to d psi. So where psi is holomorphic on uh, pi one of s equivariant under some map rho zero that goes from pi one of s to c. So why is it true? Because psi is just well defined up to some constant. Okay, because taking the primitive of a one form, you obtain something which is well defined about to some constant. And then you see that this constant that's really defined. And in particular, if you take gamma, gamma star of psi minus psi. Huh? Uh, so what is rho of gamma? So you have indeed gamma star of psi minus psi uh, d of that is equal to zero. So that's imply that uh, gamma star of psi minus psi is equal to rho zero of gamma. And then a further check, which I'm not going to do here, but as an exercise, exercise, classic, the real part of rho zero, this is just the map which I say to gamma, this period which I defined before. Right? So now I have a, uh, obtained my, uh, almost obtained my, 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 my um, so I'm sorry to, uh, to go over here. So what is my map three? So I start from omega. I build psi on x and rho zero. And then I take the real part of psi. And that's going to be f, my harmonic function. And I'm going to take rho, which is the real part of rho zero, which is rho. Right? So this is exactly my construction of my map three. So again, I claim that this is not a difficult theorem in the sense that it only involves two facts: the fact that the harmonic form is a real a harmonic uh, function is a real part of a holomorphic form on Poincaré lemma. Right? Is that clear? Can I proceed? I'll wait if you have uh, when you have finished writing. So I claim now that. The hard part is starting with a function to obtain this harmonic representative. Okay. And again, I'm going to prove that in a way more complicated way that is necessary, but this is just for uh, trying to, uh, to explain what, what happened for another situation when we change R with some other group. So now let's concentrate on three. On four, 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 four. And again, you should really remember this fact about harmonic form being real part of holomorphic functions. Four construction of a map from chi of S R to the space of pairs where F is a harmonic function. And rho is a representation of chi of SR. So here I'm just adding a decoration to the representation, which is this harmonic equivalent function. Right. So this is this this part 
has nothing to do about complex analysis, almost nothing to do about actually complex geometry, right? So how do you do that? So that is the first step. Well, okay, so the theorem is the following. Let's, let's say the theorem. Theorem. So given rho, which is an element in chi of SR, there exists a unique, a unique rho equivariant harmonic form, equivalent harmonic function, rho, uh, f from uh, x, which is like two, again this universal cover, to r. So how does the proof go? So first, uh, let's prove uniqueness. This part is, is easy. So assume, so let f on g be uh, harmonic. Okay. And rho equivariant. If I make the difference, f minus g is again harmonic. This is a pretty linear con condition at this stage. And now it's what? It's rho constant, rho invariant. So this means that f minus g is equal to the real part of psi, where psi is a rho zero from this, uh, is a rho zero uh, uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm say, saying something totally stupid. Uh, it's, it's gamma invariant. It's invariant under the action of pi 1 of s. I'm so sorry, which is what I meant. So there's no such thing as a rho invariant uh, object. So it's invariant under the action of pi 1 of s. Okay. So this means that this is a real world part of psi, where psi is invariant under psi 1 of s. So this means that psi is holomorphic, unholomorphic. So this means that psi comes from a holomorphic function. on S, and I'm pretty sure that you said that holomorphic functions on S, on a closed Riemann surface, are constant, hence constant. So, uh, so I'm not claiming exactly that F is unique, up to a constant, an additive constant. Okay, so that's a uh, proof uniqueness. So let's prove existence. So existence. First thing is that there always exist. A smooth rho equivalent function on S. So that's exercise. That's going to be an exercise that you should do for yourself. 
And this is related to the fact that R is just a purely topological fact, which is related to the fact that R is, contract is uh, contractible. It's not immediate, but that's true. Well, let's call it this function ft. F, 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 F. Not yet. So what I'm going to do now is to deform, the goal now is to deform F to a harmonic function on X. Thank you. I want to deform my function to a harmonic function. So how do I do that? So I am going to introduce some new object. So a uh, definition. Uh, if uh, uh, H is a smooth rho equivalent function, On X, let the energy of F of H to be the integral over delta. I'm going to explain what is delta of, so let's say, be respectful at the one half of the norm of dH square omega zero. So what does this all this means. I need to explain a few stuff in that, in that uh, formula. So here, so here, delta is a fundamental domain for the action of gamma. So what is this norm? What is the norm of the F? This means that I choose, I could have chosen other, uh, other uh, metric, but let's choose, it's, this is measured with respect to some let's say hyperbolic metric, but it's used too much, but I, I don't need that, right? Some hyperbolic metric, so uh, metric, where well, two, the hyperbolic metric on S conform all to J. So it means that I could choose actually any metric, negatively curved metric, for which the uh, rotation by 90 degrees is exactly J. And finally, omega is the area form, form of the hyperbolic metric. So on this object is by definition the energy of H. So now let's uh, collect some facts, which are quite important. Take some facts. So first, the energy of H does not depend on delta, of the choice of the fundamental domain. And that is just because the norm of the H now is gamma invariant. If you have a gamma invariant function, if you integrate it under any fundamental domain, it's the same function, it's the same number. So then, so-called variation formula. So if HT 
is a one parameter family of functions with uh, Uh, with a um, with what? I'm sorry. Uh, with h zero is equal to h. Then d over dt of the energy of h t. This is going to be the integral of d of dh composed with j times uh, times what? Uh, let's say or minus times um, times the variation of ht at t is equal to zero. So these two forms is a function, so I can and can perform that. Right. Actually, um, this is not the definition which I wanted to use. So um, I so remark it is there is something which does not depend on the on the function, which is the the energy of H. Again, it's, this is an exercise. So this is one half the integral of a x of a of a delta again of the two form, which is df df composed with df wedge df composed with j. So you may like it better. And again, there could be a plus or minus one. So as a corollary, a harmonic a function is harmonic So a function is harmonic. So a function is harmonic. This is essentially the same thing as to say that uh, H is harmonic. H is a critical point. Point of the energy. If you vary the energy, uh, if you function if varies the energy, then the, this uh, number is going to be zero. So what do we want to get? Is we have this uh, energy function, all right? And I start with a function, and I want to get to a critical point, h, which is harmonic. So we all know what to do. We just let it roll, and it's going to end up there. So what does it mean? We just apply a gradient flow to that. So now the idea of the proof of the proof is apply a gradient flow. So what is the gradient of the energy? This is going to be the map. F gives rise to the Laplacian of F. And I didn't check all signs here because there is a classical issue with signs in, the in all the theory. So where? Laplacian of f times omega zero is equal to d d f composed with j, and so that is comes from uh, fact two. The fact that this is a gradient flow, right? So in other words, we now consider the solution of the so-called heat equation. So the heat equation. So a function f from t, actually from 0 plus infinity cross s to r, 
is a solution of the heat equation if uh, d over f over dt is equal to uh, minus the Laplacian of f. I'm sorry, I have not been uh, careful enough to check what are the correct signs. So now, facts again, which are not easy to prove. At first, there exists a solution to the heat equation. So how do you do that? The best way to solve this kind of equation is to apply Fourier transform. And you transform this object, function on a disk, to, uh, well, okay, you apply Fourier transform, and you actually you have an explicit kernel solutions meaning that you can write ft as the integral of a, against f of a certain very complicated function, which is called the kernel, which is a green function in that context. Secondly, when t goes to infinity, goes to infinity, this is as you expected, so that your gradient converges to a harmonic form, then ft converges to a harmonic function which is, of course, rho equivariant. It is rho equivariant. Of course, I should have said that this gradient flow preserves the rho equivariance, and the solution of the heat equation also preserves the heat equation. So that's a complicated way to, to, to prove this beautiful theorem, which has a much simpler proof. But I want to say some justification for that. So I have now come to... Uh, half of the talk I was supposed to give. So, uh, so let's now move to some other thing and introduce some new objects. And I'm going to be uh, uh, now talking about no, here you mean stability, like stability of bundles? Yes. Right here, we have just one critical point. So we don't have issues. So whatever, we just said, we just proved uniqueness before. So now I want to talk, my second talk is to talk about chi of S, S1. So tomorrow, I'm going to explain about a theorem, which is a, a Abel theorem. Because again, there is a group isomorphisms. Now, a group isomorphism of chi of S S1 with something which is called pick, pick a group of S, that's going to be the space of holomorphic line bundles. So I'm going to start by explaining what are holomorphic line bundles. Why do they form a group of, the, of degree zero, of degree zero? And, uh, and, um, and I'm going to explain the same kind of construction. And maybe that's going to be my last comments. So 
I'm going to, to have this object, which is chi of S, S1. I'm going to this pip car group, which is space of holomorphic line from Dole. And here I'm going to have a third object, which is a space of pairs where L is a uh, line bundle, not necessarily holomorphic, a nabla, which is a flat connection, and G, which is a constant metric a parallel metric, parallel metric on L. So now the situation that is going to be again easy, and I guess uh, here, so both of these are basically uh, Mahan's functors, and uh, this one is going to be easy. But this one is going to be hard, right? So, and then in the third talk, I'm going to explain that, but I want to replace S1 of R with any group. And the first step, I'm going to make something which is totally artificial, which is to say that, uh, uh, so before, Remember before, so let's, that's a comment I should have made, but I'm happy to, to have a little time to make it. So before I say that we have this a representation rule, which is uh, a map from pi 1 of s into r. So let's, let's call this r g, right? And then I also add a map F, which was an equivalent map from uh, the universal cover to R. It turns out this is not the same R, right? It's only very confusing in low dimension because everything is R, but suddenly it's not the same R. So this is a space E. And what is the relation between G and E? G is the isometry group of E, right? So the action of G on E is the action of G on its isometry group. And, uh, and uh, so here we have something which is like that, because I have uh, my uh, uh, right, so um, so let's uh, let's make this, uh, the final comment here. What's going to be the ma making the two guys together? So I'm going to chi of s into uh, um, s one cos r. Okay, so s one cos r is c star. And here, the third guy is going to be the space of L is a line bundle. And uh, uh, G is a, and Nabla is a flat connection. And G is a, now not constant, but a harmonic metric on L, and then the third object is going to be now a space of L, which is a line bundle, holomorphic line bundle, and my Riemann theorem tells me that the th this object here is going to be omega, which is a, a holomorphic an element of one H one zero. So I'm going to make again something which looks terribly artificial at this stage. 
And this is because, uh, this is, and this is why this theorem never appears in the literature. So I'm going to say that omega one zero of S, this is a space of one zero form of holomorphic form with value in R. And now I'm going to consider that R as a trivial bundle. Right? But it turns out now, if I take any holomorphic line bundle, the group of endomorphism of this line bundle is trivial. So this is the same thing as the endomorphism of L. If I take a line bundle, what are, what are the automorphisms? It's just multiplying by some lambda. So the, the, the endomorphism of some line bundle is trivial. So in the other word, I'm going to, to couple this object with L being a holomorphic line bundle on a function, on some number which I want to call the Higgs field, which is a one zero form with value in the endomorphism of L. Which, which number is real? Sorry, thank you. Sorry, it's a, uh, it's a value in C, right? Uh, the, the, the form are with value in C, so it's, here it's C. So I'm going to make something very artificial to create a new theorem that did not exist, which is to identify the automorphism of, of S into C star as a space of what are called Higgs fields, exactly, a pair of a holomorphic bundle under one form with value in the, in the endomorphism. So that's a, but tomorrow I'm going to explain basic stuff about holomorphic bundles, what they are, connection on those, and, uh, and all that stuff, and maybe I'm going to explain the theorem. So you notice here that in this situation we have two theorems, because both ways are hard. Both, both ways are hard. Because this one is, uh, it wasn't hard because of the R, but now this one is hard because of the, of the S one. So both theorem, there, you need both theorem here. You need a theorem here and a theorem here. The other construction being uh, forgetfuls. Forgetful. So I should really stop, right? Um, no, I have two more hours. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, any questions, comments? Uh, Mahan, you have So, uh, the, the heat flow in, in general, I mean, it, the, it's an efficient thing. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, how much does it, does it converge fast to the critical point? I mean, are there rates of convergence that one knows of? Well, uh, the whole idea is to actually control the contraction of the heat flow by, so, by the contraction of the norm. Yeah. So, so in general, you have this harmonic, so you're acting about harmonic uh, mappings rather than harmonic function. Yes. The whole idea is, so you have this uh, harmonic mapping and you want to control it, uh, it, that it converged by the heat flow. But essentially what you do is you control the norm of the differential of the harmonic mapping and show that this satisfies a heat, heat, equa heat inequation and then you control it by the classical heat equation stuff. But I'm just going to wave my hands about that for several reasons. This I worked on that like 20 years ago and that's not remember anything. Any more questions, comments? Uh...